You're listening to the cycling podcast Femina in association with Rafa, the fastest clothing in the world tour, the home of cycling with character. Ride and watch with Rafa in 2019 as they partner EF Education First and Canyon Shram. Listening to the Cycling Podcast Femina, brought to you by Skoda. Dedicated to closing the gender gap in cycling, one race, one cyclist at a time. This is our time. Today we're in Stowmarket. The Peloton will reach 15 kilometres to go. The time gap increases further. One minute. 40 seconds. 140 to the front. 140 to the front. Great job, Abby May. Do not switch off behind. Come on. Less than 10k now, Abby May. Come on, less than 10k. Come on, Abby May. Come on, you got this. All those years of training, all those years of preparation. Come on, this is it. Drive, drive, drive. Dig, dig, dig. Come on. And 10 seconds advantage for rider number 85 with four kilometres to go. Make them chase you all the way to the finish, Abby, mate. Really good job. You should be very, very proud of yourself today. Great job. Come on, girls, behind. This is just the start. We're here to race. Let's show everyone we're here to race. Come on. Well, Rose Manley, what were we played in with there? Oh, well, that was part of my day in the drops car where... I mean, there wasn't much to say for most of the stage, but then Abby Mae Parkinson made an amazing solo attack and Bob Varney was just going for it, giving her the extra watts, shouting lots of motivational things, some kind of sweary things, <laughs> and uh, but actually she couldn't hear them. So, <laughs> so it was wasted. Did you did you find it inspiring? Or? I did. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Graham Hurd, who was in the car, also, you know, said, "Give did me a bike." Down? He said, "Give me a bike right now. I will go and win this stage." <laughs> you know, it was giving. You know, it, like you know, it should have given this is, her. This is hard to measure. Two hundred extra uh, watts. Maybe, maybe you know? we should play that clip to ourselves every morning in the yeah. women's tour and do like a Mr. Motivator I mean, type stretch. I know, I know, Graham, I, I know yeah. Graham Heard quite well. If, if it inspired him, then it must yeah. have been very <laughs> rousing indeed. Uh, my name is Richard Moore and I'm with Rose Manley, yeah. who you just heard, and Orla Shinui. Hello. And this is the first of our nightly, daily podcast from the women's tour, stage one today. Where are we, Orla? We are in Stowe Market, which is in East Anglia, a lovely little market town. We started in a market town today, mm. didn't we, in Beckles, which was beautiful i fell in love with that place it was like a Mm. living museum to english quaintness and now we're in still market where the race finished and it was a bit bit wet here as well but it dried up and and i think the weather played a part today in the racing it was quite breezy and wet and uh quite a long stage although it wasn't that far they weren't that far apart it was a long old stage today so what happened, Orla? We're going to do your story of the stage. We are. A lot of expectation. Well, this. yeah, feeling the burden <laughs> of that expectation. I need Bob in my ear giving me encouragement. Mm. Because, well, we decided we were going to do a little a few uh, cultural or geographical themes, didn't we? And so I was trying to think of how to theme the story of the stage today. And John Milton used to make regular visits here. Did you both know in your Wikipedia research? You know, <laughs> Richard's pulling a face. I well, did. he did. I did, because there was well a picture done. of John John Milton on the, the wall of the Weatherspoons that we were briefly <laughs> in. And then up yeah. sticks and came what, here. What? And I had to down, down yeah. my half pint of What lager, likely so. bedfellows, John Milton and Weatherspoons. I'm sure uh, they're yeah. all reading We've Paradise gone from Lost. Too, too much <laughs> noise, <laughs> too little noise here, haven't we? It was, it was, it was, it was a bit of laughter cutting through in the Weatherspoons. And it wasn't ours. Yeah. And quite frankly, we only want our own fun. But anyway, yeah, so I was actually going to uh, base it around John Milton and his famous poem, Paradise Lost, um, which tells the story of Adam and Eve, essentially. So I was waiting for pandemonium or some sort of redemption in the race. I was going to mistakenly name Manon Lloyd Mammon, one of Satan's followers, but we didn't see her very much in the race. And I thought it was a bit unfair as well. It's not very nice, is it? No serpents as a comparison. here, it's a no women's serpents. race. And also the poem uh, follows the epic tradition of starting in medias res, or the midst of the race, or the background then coming later. But if I did that, 
there wasn't much of a background. There wasn't much at the start of the race. So I thought, sod that, sod Milton, sorry, John Milton. And I went for John Peel instead because he lived near here and there's a John Peel sort of arts and culture centre nearby. Um, his kids well, went to Are we not here. in the John Peel centre here? I knew here. you thought that earlier and I didn't want to correct oh, you. Oh, right, <laughs> sorry. The lady thought... from the Ronnie from oh, sorry. Uh, John Pe- the John Peel centre. No, we're in the mix. This ah. place is called the mix. The John Peel centre is nearby, I think. Um, but we did have a guy from the John Peel Centre playing us amazing acoustic music earlier. Do you like, I like the way Orla says Peel, do you? Yeah, I do. It's lovely. Peel. 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 What, why do you peel. say it? John Peel. Peel is how I would say P-A-L-E. Like if you hadn't had enough sun. You're a bit peel. Pale? Yeah. Oh that's my how God. I would say that. Ah, okay. Whereas if you peel an orange, you peel it. You don't peel it because that would be to like impale it. Oh, the vagaries of our accents. So anyway, basically we don't know what any of each other are talking about most of the time. It's basically but what we've worked out. we get talking about cycling? Before we yes. do, though... But maybe John tell Peel. people who John Peel was, yeah. Well, yeah, famous oh, yeah. DJ, Radio 1 DJ principally. Started off in Radio Caroline, isn't that what it was called? The um, Only Pirate Richard is old enough radio to know. Station. <laughs> what was your favourite genre that John Peel championed, Richard? What do you think? Indie. Indie. Uh, wedding Sad present, depressing. the Smiths, all that kind of stuff. He loved all that. Rose? Got to be a connoisseur for dub reggae. What yeah? can I say? Yeah. You look at me, you think, dub fan. <laughs> There's a reggae girl. There's a dub gal. Anyway, we ain't talking about dub. We talking about the women's tour. And that might give you a bit of a clue because I've thrown in some John Peel song references. See how many you can find. Right. Well, as we've already said, it was fairly uneventful. We haven't started yet. <laughs> what? Uh, I'm about what to it? The- <laughs> Sorry. What? I thought we'd already started the story of the stage in a roundabout fashion. Yeah, I wow. guess so. Okay, go. We've given, a, we've given a cultural background to where we are. Okay. Mm. Um, but now for the stage itself, um, fairly uneventful for the first part of the race, so no anarchy in the UK. The heavens opened shortly after the race left Beckles this morning. Not the nicest of days in the road, as you said, Richard. Didn't stop the good vibrations along the roadside, though. We had the usual fantastic crowds, school children lining the roads with flags, Teenage kicks and older fans alike. I just love that about modern racing in the UK. It's become quite common, people, hasn't it? To have just this atmosphere that's Wait a minute, really you're calling synonymous. the spectators common people? No, I'm calling you two people. I say it's quite common. I want to live like them. Yeah, I do. You do. <laughs> Done. Anyway, no matter what the weather, the fans turn out here, and I love that. It's great to see you again today. Not a happy d- a day of happy cycling, though, for Anna Trevisi of Ali Cipollini. She had a crash fairly early on, didn't finish the stage, so our first abandonee. Um, the first intermediate sprint went to last year's winner, Corin Rivera of Sunweb, so quite a groovy feeling for her to know she's coming into form and it matters again. With Sheila Gutierrez-Ruiz of Movistar in second and Rivera's young teammate in third, Suzanne Anderson. Uh, the Sunweb Riders, thick as thieves in the second sprint with Rivera, Anderson and Leah Kurtzman taking the points there. Then Christine Majerus showed she had plenty of mountain energy taking the first set of Queen of the Mountains maximum points. And we spent much of the first 135 kilometres, no, no less, um, with the bunch mostly together battling through that rain. Then with 22 kilometres to go out of this wild darkness emerged Abby Mae Parkinson with our first attack off the front. The first attack with 22 kilometres to go says a lot and the drops rider built up a lead of 1 minute 40 at one stage and she took the second Queen of the Mountains points over Majerus again Uh, Parkinson did get to cross the finish line first but only on the race's first time over the finish in Stowe Market our lone wanderer with a still decent lead taking the third intermediate sprint over Mariana Voss and uh, Gutierrez Ruiz again of Movistar she was caught before the line, though, um, and awarded the Combativity Award for her brass neck move, quite rightly so, I would say. Maybe a bit of whiskey in the jar for their Team DS, Bob Varney, tonight. I think he might be celebrating that one. Um, we did have a bunch sprint for the finish in the end. They say love is a drug, but winning is a drug for Julian Dora. She got her second no drugs, opening. Please, <laughs> yeah, step away, all of um, them. High on life, yeah. She's got a lust for life, that girl. Took her second opening win in a row at the Tour of Britain in East Anglia once again. Spooky. Um, Amy Peters, her Bowles Dolman's teammate, finished in second. Um, and Lisa Brennard of WNT in third. So this evening, the jerseys go to Corin Rivera of Sunrep, who takes the sprints jersey. Queen of the Mountains to Christine Majerus of Bowles Dolman's. Points jersey to Julian Dora, as well as the green jersey for the overall leader. Best British riders, Eleanor Dickinson tonight of Drops. And the best team is Bowles. So that is how we're looking at the end of stage one. But who will have what when Saturday comes? 
That's the question. And that is your stage story of the stage. <laughs> the fastest clothing in the world tour. The home of cycling with character. Ride and watch with Ratha in 2019 as they partner EF Education First and Canyon SRAM. Bib shorts are the most essential part of your cycling kit. Hi, my name is Alexis Ryan and I race for Canyon SRAM. It's where you get the most friction, it's where you get possibly get the most discomfort, and to have a pair of shorts that are comfortable and reliable, they wear well and they're made out of high quality materials, it's, that's really important for us as professionals. My raft of bib shorts are the best in the world. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed to Rafa, our headline sponsor. Very grateful to them for their support. And I think we can offer a prize if you can identify all the song song titles, album titles, or were they song all song titles? titles? They were all song titles. In all the story of the stage today, you can win a Pedalers de Charme or Pedaler de Charme t-shirt. I think I kind of give it away because every time I said one, I could hear the smile in my voice. It was like, he, he, I'm being really sneaky here. It's a bit of an so. audio wink, isn't it, when you do it every time? <laughs> so I every, every, to every, that, audio wink. every time yeah, Orla wink, wink. every time Orla winks at you, count them up. <laughs> You've got to yeah. name the song titles as well and uh, email us contact at thecyclingpodcast.com and if several of you get it right, we'll pick a winner out of the hat. I'll be impressed if anyone gets all of those, actually. I think I snuck in they, one they or were two. Quite, you know, some of them were quite difficult. I was, some of them I wouldn't know that they were songs. Yeah. So obviously, I've had a peaky look over your shoulder, so I'm not going to be entering the competition, actually. Our manly, London. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> uh, well, listen, today's stage, Yolene Dorr was the winner. Amy Peters, second. That was a one-two for Bulls Dolmans. Lisa Brenner was third. Um, that was... Good performance for a former winner here. Um, but I think full marks to Abby Mae Parkinson today for taking it on because we were, although we weren't able to watch the race, which is a, a unique challenge of covering this race, we're, we're talking about the stage before we've seen it and we'll watch the highlights tonight. Um, but, you know, there wasn't an awful lot happening out there. And one aspect or one factor in that was the, was the, the length of the stage. Another factor was certainly the weather and also the, the length of the race as well. It's six days I think it's as much that as anything else. I was talking to Bob before the stage today and I said, you know, are you guys relishing the the difficulty of this year's race? Um, given that it has been billed as the toughest ever, it's the longest ever. And he said he had to point out to the girls la last night that last year, for example, like we said in the preview episode, there was an awful lot of talk about the final stage being so difficult and in the end it wasn't anywhere near as difficult as people had expected and so I think he was trying to encourage exactly what we saw today which was you know go on the attack don't be afraid don't be saving yourself for the perceived stages to come because we have no idea what they're going to be like and they may not be raced as difficultly as hard as as you might fear um, and that would be the only concern I guess um, with this race to come that that would be that neutralization of the racing would be a factor but to skip ahead it's why i think tomorrow's stage is going to be really exciting and, and it's good that they've broken it up like that yeah i mean it was really a dream day for drops actually being in the in the race having car, you in the car well, having me in the car it was an <laughs> absolute dream but no they but bob actually has a piece of paper uh, on his lap which just says objectives in big black letters and then it says like one two three one of them was like a top 10 uh, for ellie dickinson which you know didn't quite get but you know almost got it she finished 12, 12. 12 yeah. yeah um number two was like get the best british jersey off the back of ellie doing well in the, the final sprint and the third one was you know being being attacking getting a combativity award so really it's like tick 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 for for him so they did incredibly well and i think it's just a, a great sign to see that drops have taken that kind of attacking form which I don't think we kind of associate with them that much but I saw in Tour of California they were attacking in the Turingen Tour they were attacking and uh, Bob was saying that Abby May Parkinson felt a bit like she'd missed out in the Turingen Tour because people were marking her a bit more whenever she was trying to attack and make a break um, so she'll be well as you'll hear she was absolutely delighted to have made a solo attack and held on for so long and just built up quite a decent lead right at the end there um, and just been out to be showing herself off on those the British home roads. Well, shall we hear from Abby May uh, Parkinson and Ellie Dickinson, who was 12th on the stage? 
Abby May picking up the competitivity prize. How was it out there? It was really tough, but the crowds are incredible. Like all the kids from the schools are so, so good, like cheering on. And yeah, that really made me dig deeper. And no one seemed to have got away until you did. And it was very late on in the stage. You know, what does that say about the stage in, in total? Yeah, I mean, it was a super long stage. It was 160k, and we had 6k of neutral as well, so it was a super long day. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It was pretty steady the first 100k, and then Flotter attacked, and I sort of just countered that and managed to get away. So, yeah, that was really good. And you were just pulling that lead out more and more and more to get in the, the finish. Did you think you were going to get to the finish? or? Um, I had my doubts. Like It was always going to be a sprint finish, um, so I knew that the lead-out trains would be coming, coming in hot. So, yeah. I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to, to keep, keep on, but, yeah. This must be one of your best days at the Women's Tour, is it? Yeah, it was such a fun day out. Just coming through the finish line with one lap to go and everyone cheering my name was pretty epic. I loved that. It was, yeah, really epic. Ellie, how was that? That must have been your target for the day and you succeeded. What is that as a feeling? Um, I wouldn't really say it was... Obviously, every British rider wants to be in the best British rider jersey, but I never, ever started the day thinking, oh, I'll be in the best British rider. There's so many good British riders, so... Yeah, it was to get a top ten, and that got me, um, yeah, the best British rider. And how was that to also be on the podium when Abby May was up there for combativity as well? It was so good. It was such a good... It was such an inspiring ride. Like, in the last 20k here and Abby was there, you just... You want to do well, because, yeah, Abby did amazing out there, so you want to do well in the back end as well. And the, for the stage two tomorrow, it's a bit of a weird one, kind of like a crit. Do you think you'll do well there, manage to keep the jersey for then? Oh, I'm not too sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, obviously I'd like to hang on to the jersey, but it will be nice to just yeah get around safely. I think it could be a bit carnage tomorrow. So that was Abby May Parkinson and Ellie Dickinson. Ellie Dickinson actually the last of the, the, the first group. Um, Lizzie Dagenham finished a place behind about four seconds down, so there was a little split there. I'm not sure that will be significant, although Marina Voss, interestingly, was in that first split. She was fifth on the stage, and... And those four seconds for her may be important as the week goes on. Who knows? Um, I mean, it's easy to sit on the sofa or sit in the car and wonder why there aren't any breakaways, why nobody even seems to be trying to form a, a break. And, you know, when Abby May Parkinson went away, nobody went with her. And it's easy to, to sit and, and criticise that. But you do wonder. I mean, we wondered this during the, the Giro as well on certain stages, why teams without clear objectives in the race weren't at least trying to put themselves out there you know there's a highlights television program on tonight they're going to struggle for highlights and and if you if if there had been a breakaway even if it had been for a few kilometers with a few riders they would have ended up on the telly i mean it would suggest that the quite there there are quite a few teams here who have strong gc ambitions that's the only thing you can really say i mean for abby may to go away on her own isn't necessarily a threat for any of the GC riders or you know any of the other teams really if it was a stronger breakaway I don't mean anything on Abby May but if it was stronger in, in numbers then it would have been uh, more of a danger but it makes you think that with the caliber of riders here we've so many former winners here that it could well be a wide open GC and we've seen this race won early in uh, years gone by last year for example when Cassie Neva Doma won it a few years ago as well and that I guess is what many rivals unless it's your team you, you know you're wanting to try to avoid that and keep that race and the GC race open for as long as possible so it only suggests to me really that um, hopefully there are a few teams with strong ambitions and also everybody's talking about this race being a race of two halves and you've got the first three stages and then the hard in terms of mountainous second three stages so um, maybe yeah there's a little bit of cards being played close to the chest but I don't know about that because also I mean the GC can be a very uh, one by very narrow margins here and the intermediate sprints are really key for that because you get bonus seconds at every intermediate sprint and uh, we saw that today because they were quite tightly contested and Team Sunweb really were trying to dominate those um, but you'd think that a breakaway would be even more vital on this stage when there was three intermediate sprints so that's like you get nine seconds out of it nine seconds you could even get more than that you could get plenty of seconds if you wanted to kind of give a little, either, you know, get an early jersey or do something on the first stage so you can give your team a little bit 
bit more exposure and there was uh, two Queen of the Mountains. And so in the end, when Abby May went up, um, attacked, she ended up getting QOM points, she ended up getting intermediate sprint points. And you but think will that, that earlier come Saturday? That's the thing. If people are looking at where they want to be come Saturday, stage one, obviously, obviously GCs are, are won and lost on seconds, or at least they can be. But if you're if you're if you've got your eye on the overall by the end of the week, then avoiding losing time is, is almost as important as gaining time, isn't it? No, that's true. But I think I mean Corin Rivera said that she was that is why she, she was up and competing for those intermediate sprints because she knew that I mean we saw it at the Tour de Yorkshire, didn't we, last year when Danny Rowe made mm. it onto the podium because of how she was performing at the intermediate sprints, not how that she was, was performing tour, at the end. Actually. That was that was last year, wasn't it? She was in the podium. She women's tour, um, uh, yeah. sorry, Tour de Yorkshire though, um, as well, as and then well, and then well. the women's yeah. tour as well. Yeah, when yeah. she had that um, terrible crash, didn't she, mm-hmm. with a couple of days ago? But then I think that kind of shows how mm. key those could have been. Obviously, they did. You know, Sunweb played played it that that way, but none of the other teams seemed to be interested. But you know, it could be it could be won or lost on those seconds. Well, um, the winners on the day were Bulls Dolmans, and they've come with a, a strong team without their, you know, their their leader Anna van der Breggen, but with a very rounded team of, you know, sp- sprinters as well as Julian Dewar and Amy Peters. They've got Emily De Eriksson who won a stage last year. is a very good mm-hmm. sprinter as well. So they seem well equipped to challenge for stages. Wouldn't be surprised to see De Eriksson up there tomorrow. Um, but they've also got some strong GC riders as well, including. Christy Majerus, who is the Luxembourg champion and Queen of the Mountains in this race. Now, let's hear from Christy Majerus and then Lizzie Dagnan. Well, a mucky, a mucky day out, out there today. Uh, but talk me through the, the finale, because obviously it worked out well in the end for you guys. Uh, yeah, our leader was uh, quite perfect. Also, timing was uh, really good this time. Um, there was a solo rider alone, which is pretty easy to control when you're a big pilot, and obviously it's easier when you're more than uh, being alone. Um, yeah, we started with uh, 5k to go a little bit at the GPM and uh, delivered uh, Jolene perfectly and Amy still finished second. So yeah, it's a good day for the, for the team. The Abby May Parks had quite a big lead at one point. Were you, were you worried at all about her possibly staying away or did you feel it was all under control? Uh, no, it kind of was under control. She had a minute and there was still 10k to go. Um, and she was alone. I mean, uh, if it would have been a group for three or four, we should have been worried. Um, but uh, a lonely rider is uh, actually pretty easy to control, especially on these roads where it's like a peloton is, has a little bit of an advantage. Um, but yeah, uh, it's good to win uh, to win like this the first day, and uh, it's a good start to our tour. You've brought a lot of uh, fast, strong, fast riders with you. Fast, strong, fast. I don't know what that means, but uh, um, is that is the aim here to to try and win as many stages as possible? Is that what you're you're planning to do here? Yeah, I think we will see uh, day by day, uh, and if that works, then uh, then the whole tour is going to work. I mean, the last two days are pretty hot, um, so we have to see how we're going to feel and how the, how the peloton is developing with tiredness uh, by the end of the week. But um, till there, we will see day by day, and uh, yeah, we have uh, strong, poor sprinters like Jolene and Amelie, and we have uh, a little bit all around us like Amy and me, and uh, I mean Chantal and uh, Karos, uh coming back from training camp so they they build up form but they are pretty good so we have a little bit cuts for everything are you are you the, the gc i mean are you the gc leader of, of the team or is that something that's been discussed no i think the gc will have to see uh, after day four and then uh, and then plan around that it's pretty hard to control this race like that it's uh, pretty unpredictable and uh, it's hard to come with a gc plan from the beginning on so we'll see day by day how was it uh, just one of those days where you look I had too much time to think about how much nicer it would be on the sofa. <laughs> uh, it was just long and it was inevitably going to be a sprint, so it's kind of uh, one of them boring long days. Everyone's coming back with mud splattered all over their faces. It looks like the yeah. weather wasn't very kind to you either. Was that particularly no. brutal? I mean, it was fairly mild, actually, but just once you soaked through, it was really cold. Like, I I went back to the car and I was wearing two rain jackets at the point, so that says a lot. <laughs> what was your game plan for today, then? Uh, just to get through the race safely like we don't have a sprinter here so um, actually we wanted kind of our rivals like Mariana who's a GC contender not to get points uh, seconds in the sprint and uh, so if a breakaway went great um, just kind of save ourselves really 
And save yourselves for what then? What's the overall ambition? What's your personal goal this week? To be honest, I'm having a rest after this. So uh, it's kind of just like a consolidation of the first block. Um, and just but race days, just keep on adding those up, really. Hi, I'm Juliette Elliott. I'm a cyclist. I race all kinds of bikes, mountain bike marathons, fixed gear crits, road races, BMX, a bit of downhill enduro too. I write about bikes, so I'm a journalist, I'm a blogger, a video maker, I'm a British cycling coach and a mountain bike guide. I support Skoda's campaign to close the gender gap in cycling. This is our time. I'd like to see more women riding bikes, mainly because I want more women to ride with and I want more women racing because the more women at races, the more fun it is for everyone. But also I kind of feel like I get to enjoy this really, really cool thing and other women aren't experiencing it and I, I think they should be, they're missing out. So I'll do anything I can to get more women involved. I mean, every time I go to a race, me and my mates, we're always trying to recruit more female racers. But yeah, I mean, not just for racing though. I just think women should be riding bikes for fun. It's, it's not all about pushing yourself. It can just be just for recreation as well. Thank you very much indeed to Skoda for supporting the Cycling Podcast Femina again. They did last year and gave us a lovely car last year and they've given us a lovely car again this year. A different car. Different car. What do you think of the colour? I can't remember the colour. <laughs> it's grey. It's grey. That's the only it's thing. Very, oh, that's why. It's unusual. I it's it. an unusual, but quite... I, it's grown on me. It's yeah, grey. Yeah, grey. Yeah. I mean, reason- I, I find myself embarrassingly cliched whenever people talk mm. about cars because mm. somebody asked you earlier what kind of Skoda we have and I was like uh grey <laughs> and that's about as far as I go unfortunately but just, Orla, you know if why you're we, listening why, can Skoda. I just say though you know why we don't know the colour of this Skoda me and Orla oh no Orla did me or I didn't is because we arrived at the airport to oh, get picked yeah. up <laughs> by Richard Moore in his fancy Skoda 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 and uh he didn't turn up. So um, Tom Carey of The Telegraph uh, picked oh, us I up. Just, Kindly yeah, served yeah, by yeah. the airport and picked us both up. Because Richard, it's not, it's, it's, Richard it's not, said... I was listening to a really good podcast <laughs> I, and I, didn't, I couldn't be bothered. No, because I landed um, two hours, two and a half hours late... Uh, because my flight was delayed, thinking, oh, poor Richard will have been waiting for me at the Mm-mm. airport. God love no, his, no. you know, his little No, self. I'm not going to do that. And um, um, I landed to a message saying, um, oh, my, my sat-nav has just told me that I won't be there for another however long. I'm stuck in horrendous traffic. No, and he I, didn't and do I that, thought, Ola. He did a minute-by-minute update <laughs> yeah. as his uh, arrival time got a minute later. But I assumed, given that he was supposed to be at the airport at that stage, that he was maybe stuck in the M25 or something. It's only when Tom picked us up that he informed us that he was he was messaging us from London Bridge. Tower Bridge. Had, Tower Bridge. He hadn't even left London I'd yet. Left. He left, left on, South London. <laughs> I'd left. So so unless the Skoda sprouted wings, I don't think you would ever have made it on time. Yeah, but you were just enjoying yourself. You'd probably have the, uh, the good Skoda sound you know, system exactly. going, the comfort. It's one of those cars know. where you don't mind being stuck in traffic because it's so comfortable. The sporty nice seats. It's like the longer this goes on, I'd the better. I'd love to know. We'd love to know. And then you of the luxury of being so stuck in traffic. Every time I saw it, night had fallen. So oh, when I you're saying, saying what colour yeah. is the car, I'm like, could and have been you spend dark blue. with don't know. With, uh, with Bob Varney, of and course. Then, yeah. It's an Octavia VRS, very sporty. I knew um, that, really. That's really a very nice car. Thanks to Skoda. Um, we're going to do a new thing during this women's tour, or at the end of it, we're going to do a press conference, which we do at the other Grand Tours. Please leave a voice memo on WhatsApp on the number plus four four seven nine seven one three three eight two zero five. That's plus four four seven nine seven one three three eight two zero five. Leave us a message. Don't phone the number, but leave us a message, and we'll... <laughs> No one will answer. <laughs> and we will um, we will deal with those questions towards the end of the race. I'm looking forward to that. I know. Yeah. I can't wait your idea, to hear Rose. what the questions are. It was my idea. That's why I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> um, so we're going to do that. Um, now listen, one thing that caught my eye when we got the official start sheet this morning was that Bigla had only four riders in the race, a couple of uh, blank spots in their team, which was unusual. I know they've got a team in Brittany competing there and headed by Cecilia Utrecht Ludwig. So yeah, they've got four riders here only instead of six, uh, which obviously unusual. So I thought there must be a story there. I went in search of their sports director, Thomas Campagna. Now, Thomas Campagna has been in the news as well over recent months, well, over the winter, really, when a story was published in a Dutch newspaper 
alleging some inappropriate behaviour while bullying, fat-shaming and intimidating riders. Several riders spoke out against his management of the team that they'd been in in, in, in years past, including Iris Slappendel uh, and Carmen Small. Um, so uh, I went uh, to speak to him primarily, first of all, about the absence of a, a full team here, but also asked him about some of those allegations as well. So you've got, yeah, you've got four riders here and a team, obviously, in Brittany. What was the reason for um, not bringing a full team here? Uh, the reason is very simple. Out of 12 riders, we have six riders injured at the moment. Last one was uh, Sophie, who was planned to be a reserve rider, and she broke her collarbone yesterday. Nicole had also a crash in the last stage because a motorbike went into the bunch. And uh, Elise Chebby, who was planned for this race, that was rider number five, she was called unexpected uh, to university to make a final exam on a doctor uh, degree so we couldn't we couldn't get her so unfortunately uh, we have only four riders here and I, the, I know the race in Brittany is a kind of revived race did that was that a race that appealed to the likes of Cecilia just because of the, the course maybe suited her better no uh, she, the reason why uh, Cecilia was there um, was simply the 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 date of the race uh, you can see that most of the Giro contender riders are not here and Cecilia belongs to a possible podium contender and uh, they need to do. Uh, they need to go to altitude. So we we finished that race and we flew her into to the mountains, and she's already there and preparing for the Giro. That's. It. I mean, that's. We've been asking about that. Is that? Do you think the, the timing of the women's tour is just incompatible for somebody who's wanting to go to the Giro? Yes. Yes. It, 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 we can see ra- ra- beautiful races like this race, or also Plouet is 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 suffering because the good riders are not showing up because they are in World Championship preparation in altitude. Here in this case, most of these contenders are in altitude for the Giro. It's true. It's 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 a problem. Top riders are reducing the numbers of races and specifically preparing for for this those events. And that means that all the competitors of those riders need to do more or less the same. And this is why more and more top top riders are are not here. It's 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 a bit of a, a problem, I would say. Can I ask you about some of the stories around you and the team over the winter? That you know, yes. there were some allegations made about what had gone on in the team. I mean, what the, the team did respond to that, but what what's your response to to some of the things that were said? Yeah, I mean, there was only one opinion heard. You know, so far, no journalist spoke with me about it. Um, I when when Cycling News contacted me, I offered them uh, to open up the records because it's a very old case from 2015, reviewed by the UCI, uh, by four inspectors over a period of four months, and they, they closed the case um, in a way that they say there's no, nothing we can, we can find against him. So he did everything right. Uh, to say now the rules were different at that time, I think it's pretty cheap, no? Because the rules are the rules. If you go to court, the existing rules are in force. And more I can't say. Uh, we are here. We are since four years. Uh, I'm 18 years team owner. I think we have produced a lot of success. People call me a hard sport director. I'm not hard. The sport is hard. So the people need to ex- uh, accept uh, the sport. And if they come for something, they have to stand for something. And we discussed that many times before they enter the team. And um, sometimes they pretend to be ready for something like this, for a challenge like coming to our team and go through this development and then during the season they they cannot make it and then we have open talks and, and some are released because they simply don't have the quality and if they feel that they have to answer in a way that they say he did this or he did that which is still unproven um, I think that's a very very easy way and it's not the correct way what I can say is um, we are running this project, we are continuing to run this project oh, so and at the end of the day um, the best answer is always success. W- were there questions asked by your sponsors? You know, was it an uncomfortable time for you? Absolutely not, because the whole case, um, the uh, ethics commission looked into it. It was a, it was a serious case, um, and um, when the case was closed, the documents were presented to the sponsors. So the sponsors were were in line, of course. When that came up uh, three years later, that is just an old story cooked again. Uh, they asked me uh, what is going on and I said it's, a, it's the case that I've presented to you and then they closed it. For them it was clear. It was a 24-hour activity for a lot of clicks, 
I'm happy for all these online platforms, but I have to run a, a team. This is how I see it. Well, Thomas Campagna there, I mean, I didn't have, unfortunately, the article to hand when I spoke to him because there were a couple of things he said there that, that didn't really ring true in terms of the, the number of riders who, who complained. And it's worth saying that when this article was published, other riders who'd been on the team did back it up, including Annemiek van Vluten, who was there for one year. Um, they do go back a few years, 2015, as he said. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, he, he sort of came out with this line about it being a hard sport. He's not a hard DS. It's a, it's a hard sport. But, I mean, certainly um, Iris Slappendel is somebody that you know very well, don't you, Orla? She runs the Cyclist Alliance now. And in that role, they're really campaigning to improve conditions for women cyclists. Yeah, she's someone who's very aware of the of the difficulties within the peloton. And as you say, it wasn't just Campania there said that, that it was the testimony of one rider, but it was it was four who were quoted in that one article in the Volkskant, uh, Slappendal, Small, as you said, Vera Kududer and Doris Schweitzer. Um, and I would just say that, I mean, I don't know Iris incredibly well, but I've, I've gotten to know her a bit, at least um, since my move to the Netherlands. And she's far from what I would say, someone who's not hard. You know, um, I had a conversation with her about exactly what it is that makes Dutch riders so good. And she thinks that it's because they're tougher, that they're mentally tougher than a lot of the other riders, because it's a very direct, pe they're a very direct people. They're used to taking criticism. They're used to giving out criticism and none of it is, is personal. That's just the way the Dutch operate. So I certainly don't think that she would be someone who would be some sort of a, uh, what is it that Piers Morgan calls everyone? Uh, snowflake. snowflake. Snowflake, yeah. She's not exactly a snowflake, is she? I mean, um, but everyone has got their side to the story and you can only take everybody's side to the story. Well, yeah, I mean, there are one or two other people who've sort of not commented, who've been on that team and didn't want to be drawn into it. Ashley Moomin Passio was on that team for several years. Spoke to someone else who worked for that team today who, who said that there were two sides to every story. But... Um, he did say some other stuff that was interesting as well about this race and about the fact that Cecilia Ludwig has opted not to ride here um, following Annemiek van Vluten and Anna van der Breggen, who are not here as well. And that approach last year worked very well, especially for Annemiek van Vluten, missing this race, going to altitude and then going to the Giro Rosa and really cleaning up. Um, and I wonder, you know, that this is falling into the same habit as the men of, of racing fewer times and it's a problem in women's cycling because there isn't the same depth so big races like this if they are deprived of the big stars we talked about this in the preview episode last week can leave a bit of a glaring absence you know in the, in the lineup yeah but then again i mean corinne rivera said that uh on in her interview the was it last episode we did yeah episode before, um that uh lucinda brand did very well out of coming here and then going to jura rosa so i mean it's a kind of different approaches for different riders and it depends where their priorities are. I mean, the Giro Rosa is just a mammoth race. It's incredibly climby though, isn't it? And it's, it's 10 days. And I suppose if you are a pure climber, then that is where you would go. But if you're anywhere well, We between, must ask then, Ashley Moolman, who, yeah. who missed last year in order to go to the Giro, finished second at the Giro Road very, very well, but she's come here this year. I think though there's an element, and I think this is in men's cycling too, of sort of herd mentality and I think kind of Campania hinted at that that you know that they're watching what other riders are doing to prepare for the Giro and kind of copying that approach and it's not that you can't it's hard you can't conduct experiments unless you don't actually know which is the best approach because you only know what the result is in the end but you don't know what it would have been had they ridden taken a different approach. That's what I was going to say how differently would today have been raced if those riders had been there I don't think any differently whatsoever no, not at all. No. so their presence will make a difference maybe in the hillier stages but I can't see that today would be any different we didn't have a categorized climb until 124 kilometers in I mean that to me suggests that it's a route that decided how today was ridden more than anything else I mean when we look at stage three for example the Porsche stage we've got a categorized climb <laughs> two categorized climbs right at the start hopefully my theory will be proven and we'll see lots of attacks from the off but I, I Porsche attacks a Porsche attacks mm. yeah gentle sort of refined attacks no but after deadly. you <laughs> but we've got, I mean we've got Cash and Nivea Doma I mean she is absolutely uh, the pinnacle of an exciting rider who animates a race who attacks and he can climb really well so I don't think uh, you've got a bit of an obsession with Anna van der Breggen and Anna Meek van Vluten. And, yeah, and the thing Richard. is, they, they, have, they have very much copied what the men do in terms of going to altitude and doing a lot more training as opposed to racing. 
But I think it's good that so far, okay, Cecily's done it now as well, but she she was racing and not just the, the altitude bit. Um, I think it's good that that hasn't happened as yet because, as you say, they don't have the same strength and depth as, as the men's peloton. But, yeah, I don't, I, again, don't think the race is any the poorer on, on, a, on an obvious level for not having Van der Breggen and Van Vluten here because we've enough, we've enough top quality riders. And as you say, Rose, attacking riders who hopefully when, when the race and the route allows will completely blow the race apart. Well, we'll see about that, won't we? Hi, I'm Anna Christian from Team Drops and the women's tour will be very British. This is my first time I've ever ridden the race and what I've heard from it, it was pretty hard already but I think it's good that they're kind of pushing it on and trying to make it yeah, a bit harder again every year and stepping up the level so I'm quite excited. Um, hi, I'm Ashley Moman Pesio and the Women's Tour will be the most exciting race of the year. Hi, good morning. I'm Bob Varney from, uh, from Drops. I'm a sports director on this race. Uh, I think the Women's Tour will be the best race in the world again. I think there's a lot of talk it being harder and I did sense genuine apprehension from some of the girls and like any stage race we've got to take one stage at a time. Yeah, I always expect the unexpected so um, I think the only thing I would say is it's going to be the most professionally run bike race in the world. Corinne Rivera and I'm last year's OVO Energy Women's Tour winner. Uh, the Women's Tour this year will be really hard. It's funny because it's not so many sprinters here, I think. Not very many pure sprinters, so I think they're really banking it to be a pretty hard race. Um, but I think in my, that plays in my favor. I think I like a harder race. I like to shell the, the bigger sprinters, so I think it works in my favor, and I just have to keep surviving. My name is Demi uh, Follering. Um, I'm from Park Tel Valkenburg. I think the Women's Tour is uh, going to be a, real, a really hard one. I'm looking forward to the difficulty of the race, but also there are very long stages. Hannah Barnes from Canyon Sham Racing Team. Uh, the women's tour will be aggressive. I'm Marianne Vos, racing for CCC Live, and the women's tour will be one tough, exciting battle. Oh, I think it's interesting that the race is one day longer and uh, harder than ever. But yeah, the riders always make the race, so it doesn't really uh, matter how tough it is, it will be tough anyway. Tiffany Cromwell, Canyon Sharon Racing. Women's Tour will be exciting, challenging, hard, but victorious. It's always good to challenge the peloton more and more. Um, Women's Tour have definitely, every year, tried to step it up, start it, you know, much less challenging, I guess, and each year make it more and more difficult, so then everyone wants to bring that A game, and there's so much support behind it, so much, the organisation is top notch, so I think it's great, you know. It's definitely, for a lot of girls, daunting, no doubt, but at the same time, we want professional sport, we want people to be, show who's the best riders out there, so, you know, bring it on. The cycling podcast Femina is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you very much indeed to Science and Sport for supporting the cycling podcast Femina. You can get 25% off all your Science and Sport products at scienceandsport.com with the code SISCP25. That's SISCP25 at scienceandsport.com. Uh, and before that, we heard a little montage of voices from the start this morning in Beckles uh, from some of the riders uh, looking ahead to the week's racing and uh, one or two of them saying what they thought of the course and, and this sort of game of two halves that we've got where there are three difficult stages towards the end. What are you two looking forward to most, would you say? I am going to go for stage two at this stage. I've got lots of things that I'm looking forward to, but I like to live in the moment, so that's as close to the moment as I can look forward to. Um, because it's something different in the women's tour, and because we will see a real difference, I think, in um, between the riders who've done lots of crits in Kermes racing and those who haven't. And um, unfortunately, because we want to see as many different riders up there as possible for as long as possible, I think it's a stage that will massively suit Corin Rivera over most of the other contenders. Um, she has something like 72, isn't it, national titles to her name, including crits and all the rest of it. Um, so I'm excited to see how that's going to be raced. And that's partly, sorry uh, for any of the riders listening, because the riders themselves are apprehensive about it. And that always 
piques my interest, I think. When they're a bit nervous, I think, oh, what will this unfold as? So to, stage two is what I'm looking forward to. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it, that? Because that surprised me as well, because I even spoke to Rivera this morning, and then she was apprehensive about mm. it. She's, I think probably because also people are like playing up her chances of, of winning it. So she's probably trying to be a bit more like, it's not exactly like an American crit. And then when I say to riders, oh, it's a bit like, you know, you know, doing the tour series crits that they do around the UK. I mean, the roads, you know, will be similar. And then they're trying to play that and they're like, oh, it's not really like that. It's So it'll be interesting to see what the result I is. I hope we do have a few attacks and I hope we have a bit of action and it's not just lots of laps of the same track. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll see in the day. But at least we get to see it. I'm looking well. forward to we'll riding there. it in the morning as well. Oh, yeah. A, How many laps proper, are you going to do? Proper recce. Yeah. How many um, laps? Uh, well, well, I think we can go for a nice little bike ride in the morning because it's a late start tomorrow as well. Yeah. So yeah. Be Still fun. not asking the question. How and, many laps? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't you, don't know. Tom, can, you can give us backies, can't you? We'll just sit on, the, yeah. on your sure. seat while you. Yeah. We didn't know the plan to bring bikes. So, yeah, mm. we'll have to. You can, run. you can run, probably run at the same <laughs> speed as us. I'm also looking forward to Thursday's first hilltop finish. Mm. It's not, you know, these aren't the Alps we're talking about, but Burton Dasset Country Park, there's a little climb up to the finish. And it's quite a lumpy finale to that stage. The, fa- the last 20, 30 kilometers is pretty hilly, um, which could be with the two stages still to come. Uh, you know, it could be an opportunity for somebody because there will be riders who are holding back and waiting for the supposedly decisive next day in particular um friday's stage is, is particularly hard but that one is is an opportunity for somebody i'm thinking last year remember we saw lisa longo borghini and uh cecilia ludwig try and spring a surprise on the stage into lemmington spa wasn't it uh, i think it was into no, Lemington spa and it was quite lumpy and quite challenging and they really put the bunch under a lot of pressure it came back in the end but with this with the hilltop finish that could be quite a good little stage for somebody to to have a go. Um, Rose? Well, I feel like Rich has put my one down a bit because you made it seem like the one that I'm going to pick is a really obvious choice. And it is, but that is stage five. Mm. I'm just, oh, I'm just hesitating because I'm just <laughs> looking at a lot of a lot of consonants and not many vowels <laughs> when I say... Me, Rob Hatch. Clandrid, Clandrindod, well, Wales. Probably be Clandrindod. Clan, Clandrindod. Clandrindod. I'll get one, someone to, uh, to tell me. Okay. To Clandrindod Bilf, Wells. Wells. To Bilf Wells. Oh my, okay, I've lost it completely. The first you know, Welsh it, stage. It was downing that half a lager that has just completely put me off. Okay, uh, because that is, um, they've got two massive category one climbs there and uh, the Epint climb, which is the last climb, um, which twenty one comes, comes in the last like 15 kilometres in the very end. And that's got an average uh, gradient of 9%. So I think if there's, you know, the ones, the one, climb that's going to be a leg breaker will be that one and I like breaking legs what can I say (laughs) it's why we love cycling isn't it we can watch other people beasting themselves while we try to stay dry and warm absolutely well lots to look forward to and we'll be back every night with our podcast um uh and uh yeah tomorrow from Gravesend where we must drive to now let's do it let's go Oh, oh well, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Rose, for, for mimicking <laughs> our piano. It was, actually, it was actually... The thing is, I didn't know what kind of guitar. music it was. So I did guitar and then so, I did piano. Yeah. Yeah. Th- sure. This is why I thought we were in the John Peel Centre. Peel. John Peel Centre. <laughs> because when we came down here earlier to have our lunch, we're sitting in the sort of the now closed cafe bit, there was uh, a guy playing acoustic guitar in the corner and it was beautiful um and his name is alton Wahlberg, and he was from the john peel center um and we got chatting to the guys from the john peel center uh, ronnie was telling us about sort of upcoming concerts and whatnot and um they have the wedding present playing no less. on friday john peel's favorite it's sold out present. but um yeah they're playing there anyway uh, so it sounds like they have a great uh like repertoire of concerts coming up but uh, yeah Alton Wahlberg sounded absolutely beautiful and he's got an album out at the moment called Photographs and Memories and I went over and held my phone aloft next to the speakers just so we could share in the beauty of the music with all of you and now we're going to play the wedding present all the way home (laughs) all the way to our next hotel Uh, well that and uh, while we've been recording Lionel Burney has sent me a little uh, music suggestion as well. Dolly Parton, Jolene, <gasps> gotta be done. Yes. In aid of the stage winner. But this, though, is Alton Morbus. Destiny is calling me. Oh.